All right, good to go. Welcome everyone to our first panel discussion after the premiere of When the Salmon Spoke. Trixie Bennett, you cut do a suck. My name is Trixie Bennett. Yale Yeh Nakatiti. I am Raven Moaiti. Katchari Ayakat. I am of the Katchari clan. Kichi hit. Frog house. Shtakin Kwan Ayakat. I am of the Shtakin Kwan people. <clears throat> Talpan Dot Ayakat. I am a, a grandchild of the Talpan. Nanya A Adi. I am a grandchild of the Nanya A. As such, I invite you to transport yourself to the place where I grew up, the mighty Stikin River watershed, part of the traditional lands of the Hlinket and the Taltan. As indigenous people, we've always known we're connected to each other through the land and our foods and through salmon. When the Salmon Spoke is about reconnecting indigenous bloodlines along British Columbia and Alaska's salmon rivers, it's about reconnecting us, all of us. In telling our stories, we nurture those relationships we have with one another, with the land and with the water. We hope to inspire each of, in each of you action to benefit each of our communities and the ecosystems of our traditional territories. We hope you will ask lots of questions today, whether they be about your own indigenous connections or maybe you, want, you too want to help by nurturing our connections to all our relatives, including the salmon. I will now hand this over to Kirby Muldo. He will be the moderator of today's discussion. He will give you more information and how, a little bit more about how this format will work. Again, Gorochish, Hawa, and Midu for being here all together. Thank you. Uh, Wilts, we get Kiksan. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Yuxta. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hapulaksa, which translates to the carrier of wisdom. Um, I'm from the Fireweed Clan, more specifically the house of We Get, of the Gixan people. My mother comes from the Tinsan people. My father comes from the Gixan people. I come to you today from the unsurrendered, unceded lands of the Gixan people. We're here today with some of the storytellers, as well as the creative director and producer of When the Salmon Spoke for Wow Wow, a conversation, a live conversation where you, the audience, can submit questions and engage with the storytellers and creative director and producer. We use the term wow wow to describe our panel discussion today as it means a conversation in the, in the Chinook trading language. The Chinook trade language has been used for hundreds of years by those communicating and trading in the Pacific Northwest, especially along the great salmon rivers like the Stikin, Skeena, Nass, Fraser, Columbia, and Klamath. From what's now known as Alaska and BC and down into Northern California and east of Montana. If you haven't had a chance to see When the Salmon Spoke, it's an online production featuring epic imagery, indigenous music and visual art, and captivating life stories from the Stikeen River watershed, presented by Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission and Ping Chong and Company, in collaboration with Skeena Wild Conservation Trust and Salmon Beyond Borders. When the Salmon Spoke is led by Tis Peterman, Anita McPhee and Ping Chong and Company associate uh, artist Ryan Canero, a civic artist based in Juneau and Brooklyn. The production is part of Ping Chong and Company's acclaimed Undesirable Elements series of community specific documentary performances, adapted as a digital experience in the COVID 19 era. When the Salmon Spoke is now available online for, for your viewing at any time. This conversation is also being recorded and will be available for viewing in the near future as well. You can learn more about the project in which digital production, excuse me, you can learn more about the project and watch the digital production 
at the website shared in the chat on Zoom and on the comments in Facebook. I will now introduce the, the storytellers and panelists so that the audience knows who is on the panel. Tis Peterman is from Clinkett and Taltan descent. Anita McPhee is from Taltan and Clinkett descent. Frank Young Jr. is of Haida descent. Alan Edzertza is of uh, Taltan descent. Trixie Bennett is Clinkett and Taltan descent. Uh, Lovey Brock is of Haida descent. Ryan Canero, When the Salmon Spoke creative director and producer. Before we get to Wow Wow, I would like to take a minute to recognize a friend of mine, Richard Wright. Richard Wright passed away last week at his home in Gixan territory. Richard was a fierce warrior when it came to protecting and defending the environment, protecting and defending indigenous human rights for all, even for those who didn't agree with him. Richard was very passionate about protecting and defending the land, water and air so that our children grandchildren and those yet to be born can enjoy some qual the same quality of life we do. He recognized that we have to carry on the fight as our ancestors did for us. Richard, you will be missed dearly. Rest in peace. And I'd just like to pause for a few seconds. Hagulian, Hagulian. Wow. Okay. We have two audiences today: those of you joining us via Zoom, and those of you joining us on Facebook Live. For our Zoom participants, please submit your questions for the panelists using a Q using the Q and A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those of you joining us on Facebook, please ask your questions using the comments feature. Our team will do our best to ensure your questions make their way to the dialogue tonight. Um, and we'd also like to give a very big thanks to Brianna Walker for setting this all up. Amazing work, Brianna. And with that, let's get started. I'll ask the first question to get us started. Uh, to the storytellers, um, why did you choose to be part of this? Anybody want to go first? Should I direct it to, how about Tiss? Let's go to Tiss first. You're muted, Tiss. Okay. I'm not sure how I got involved in this. It started, um, Heather introduced me to Ryan by email in December of 2017. And uh, it just went from there. He came to Wrangell and met Lovey and I, and, put, and I saw his production from Juno. And I don't know, it just kept on gaining momentum throughout the time since. And since then, I think we've become great friends. We've met a lot of BC uh, First Nations, our brothers and sisters from BC, including you, Kirby. And it was, it's been a crazy ride. It's, <laughs> um, we got to meet Richard uh, during a tour of uh, Maddie Lee over in BC last spring. And then things just ramped up through the COVID virus. So. Here we are today. I'm very honored to be here. Alan. Thank you, Kirby. I'd like to uh, first extend my thanks to you all for inviting me to be a part of this. And um, 
I'm here in Abbotsford in the uh, Stolo people's unceded, unsurrendered title and rights to this land. Um, the reason I got involved in this project, I guess, is my initial discussions with uh, the group was really about telling the story of our people, telling the story of how we connect to the salmon. And, um, and in my view, our salmon today that the wild stocks of the Pacific salmon are becoming endangered. And so I wanted to be a part of this story to talk about the salmon and try to make people aware that they are moving towards an endangered species. Thank you again, and I'm also honored to be a part of this project. Thank you, Alan. How about you, Trixie? Why did you choose to be a part of this? I think um, I've been working um, with uh, the Transboundary Commission, and um, I know the folks at Salmon Beyond Borders, and um, had met Ryan, and um, I think there's a, such good stories to be told. I've heard them all my whole life um, growing up in Wrangell um, with half of my family up the river, um, pretty disconnected from them other than my one Aunt Betty and then my grandma, Elsie, of course, later in life. Um, well, uh, as I was growing up, but um, I just felt pretty disconnected from the people up there. And um, I knew that this would help um, me get to know them and in work with the CTIC. And um, I've, I've met some of these people like Alan and um, of course, Fred and Kirby and, um, um, and they're passionate and they're people I knew I wanted to work with and I trusted to tell our story. So that's it. Um, I'm honored to, to to be part of that. Good. <laughs> Lovey and, uh, and and your brother. You're you're uh, you're muted. You're muted, Lovey. Okay. Okay. Am I still not muted? Okay. Very good. Sorry. And it's Frank. Sorry, I forgot your brother's name for a second. <laughs> you can call me whatever you want. Can you hear us now? Yeah, no, I got here because they want to know about fishing, you know. And I started in 1950 with my dad. And uh, actually, I actually I was on a boat when I was five years old. I can still remember in Craig, you know, going over to Scow Bay, fishing with my dad. but. Uh, it's just, uh, we talked about the things that have changed over the years, you know, and how, how, how the method of fishing has changed, you know, halibut fishing and everything, you know. We went from J-hooks to circle hooks, you know, and, and then people wonder why the fishing is getting depleted in that, you know. But, you know, you go to, from a J-hook to a circle hook, halibut fishing, and with, with a J-hook, you can lose the halibut, and with a circle hook, you can't, you know. So you kill a lot of fish off, and, Everything has just become more sophisticated, you know, fishing, sailing, everything. And that was just a little bit, just a story I wanted to tell about how it was when I started, how it is now. Lovey? Thank you, Kirby. Um, I really got into this because when I saw what happened with Mount Polly and I didn't want our sticking river to be polluted for my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. Um, and I thought I could be a part of helping save the waters. So um, yeah, so I joined. Thank you, Lovey. Uh, Fred. What made you want to become part of this? I had to. <laughs> um, I'm very interested in 
in all of the rivers. And I was at the time the outreach consultant for the SEITC. And so it's, it's a great project because it helps put a face on the river instead of just being someplace out in the middle of nowhere to somebody or river number 10 that can just be wiped out for a mine or 16 mines. But to put a face or a lot of faces on the river. Ryan, what, what made you want to be a part of this? Thanks, Kirby, um, and uh, thanks everyone. Uh, it's been it's been really my honor and uh, privilege to be a part of this. Um, I am originally from North Georgia. Um, I first moved to Alaska uh, right after I finished college in two thousand one, and um, since uh, since that time was an Alaska based artist um, most of those years in Juneau, and. Um, over time, I, you know, came to know some of the people at Salmon Beyond Borders and really respect and love their work as a concerned citizen from the community who lived in and lives in the region and um, embraces that, um, that landscape and the, um, the history of it and the traditional owners of it. Um, and uh, got to be a part of a project that a couple of people have mentioned here in collaboration with Frank Katas, a Clinket playwright, which was a 2018 Ping Chong and Company production, um, stories uh, from the history of downtown Juneau. And out of that uh, production um, in spring 2018, uh, folks at Salmon Beyond Borders and then TIS at Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission basically said, hey, could we talk about doing something uh, with a similar approach in collaboration with Ping Chong and Company? Um, around the work of um, the Transboundary Commission um, to help cultivate dialogue and shared understanding across the border along these transboundary watersheds. So that was the kind of, you know, coffee conversation we had and um, I think it was March 2018. It was that following December that I got to meet you, Tis, and Lovey and Wrangell. And, uh, and we've, you know, um, gone forward since then. And I, I just want to, um, you know, come back to uh, what you said a few moments ago, Trixie, about trust. Um, I appreciate hearing you um, say that today, that you felt a sense of trust to share your stories. And I felt that through the process from each of you on this, in this conversation and each of the people who participated, um, recognize that that is a, is a huge um, offering to, to share your stories in this way. And so I just wanna say thank you for that. It's been, um, it's been a really powerful experience for me personally. And um, it's been really great to be a part of um, building these new relationships. Okay, we've got uh, some questions from uh, our viewers. Uh, to Alan, can you tell us more about the title of the digital production, When the Salmon Spoke? What is the significance and relationship of the salmon for the people? The, um, thanks for the question. The, um, our, our stories handed down to, a, to us from our ancestors speaks about the salmon and um, how they came together when they were being endangered before man even. And they spoke to us about how they came into a council and how they recognized they need to be able to um, find solutions so that, they, so that they don't disturb each other's aches when they came to spawn. And um, I think it's powerful. Uh, you think about that, how powerful that is to talk about salmon recognizing the um, potential threat to their existence if they didn't find a way to uh, to not disturb each other's eggs and you know and um, and so uh, our people the way the way we um, understand that as a lesson to us is that when you come into a meetings you start off with that prayer 
and you follow the you follow the example of the salmon and the, and you're what you're doing is you're trying to come together put some difficult issues on the table and you're trying to find a solution that works for everybody you know and so the, the salmon have taught us that and uh today they're telling us again you know um when when we get told uh don't fish for the kings on the Stikine River because there's so few coming up now. Right. We're getting the same message again. And it, and if these salmon become extinct, so will we. Thank you, Alan. And I see Anita has just joined us. Welcome, Anita. Um, so this, this, the next question is directed uh, towards Ryan. How did you pick the title of this production? What is the significance of the hand motions of the storytellers at the end of the film? Sure, well, uh, I think, so I, I, maybe a, an attempt at a brief description of our process as a whole, because I think that's important for how we came to the title. Um, you. you if you viewed the piece you saw in the credits, this was a really um, collaborative leadership team leading the project. Um, we, uh, as a group, facilitated interviews really over the past two years, interviews and more informal story sharing sessions. Um, in 2019, those were in person in multiple communities. And then during this spring 2020 period, it's all been just exactly in this format. Um, and that those, um, Snapshots are, of course, what you see in the final video. We did a first interview via Zoom, um, I would say five or four or five weeks ago. Um, and then out of that, identified how each storyteller's stories fit together and how and what histories uh, are illuminated by the life stories of the eight people who are in the piece. So there's some there's a lot of important history that's not in the piece and that couldn't sort of fit into an hour and a half. Um, you know, the piece is not an encyclopedic history of the region and couldn't, couldn't be that even if it wanted to be. So the guideline is always, what are the, how are the histories connected to the life stories here? And um, we would debrief after each interview and then we kind of outlined the piece and then re-interviewed each of the eight people with a focus on the stories we anticipated would become part of the final production. And when Alan, um, actually it was, uh, it, was a, it was a gathering that I wasn't a part of, um, that, uh, that some San Miguel Border staff, um, I know at least Heather and Jill were at a gathering with Alan um, sometime in 2019 and um, with his permission recorded his welcome. And Alan, that's when you shared um, that story of the Salmon Council that you just reshared now. Um, so Heather uh, told me about that compelling um, traditional story and we um, invited you, Alan, to share that in our interview. And it, um, it really felt to, to us as a group like a really powerful um, metaphor um, and also as a traditional story, a powerful um, teaching to say um, in, the, in, the, in the world of creation, um, what are the lessons that we can learn from salmon in this region that, that in the lesson of working together. And so that's uh, how we came to the title, When the Salmon Spoke. The other question was about the gestures. Um, those gestures were actually uh, nothing more or less than an aesthetic um, impulse to bring some movement in and kind of invite people to be together, not only in story sharing on the screen, but also in a, a moment of movement. Um, and so uh, our process was super fast as well the past several weeks. So I simply um, you know, looked at what was possible in the, within this Zoom box that could be also sort of learnable um, in a quick way and um, offered that gesture sequence to each storyteller here. I want to acknowledge if that series of movements happens to invoke any traditional art form that's um, accidental and if that um, was uh, seeming to use any proprietary movement that was not the intention that mistake is mine um, but as far as we knew and our intention was simply um, uh, a way to get people moving together with um, gestures that would fit within the screen. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, um, 
and keep your questions coming, uh, viewers and listeners. Great questions. Um, so this is to all the storytellers. And um, I'm going to start with uh, Trixie. What did you learn about the upriver or downriver people that surprised you working on this project? Similarities and differences. Well, I learned that Tist is my cousin. <laughs> we we kind of are. Uh, and it it wasn't really surprising. I, over the years, I've always thought it was um, funny how you you go by people, you end up by people, and who you're supposed to be by maybe, um, and maybe and here to come find out. You know, we were our parents were by them because we were related, but maybe didn't know. And in our case, I, we didn't know we shared um, um, that we were family. So that was pretty crazy. And um, even though I grew up by tips, her daughter's one of my best friends growing up. And we were kind of rivals too, a little bit, <laughs> that natural competition, but I love her. Um, so that was really surprising. Um, similarities all across the board. We're all concerned about the same thing, especially about salmon and Wugan and, um, and we, we all want to work and but we want to don't want it to come at you know, the job to come at the cost of um, our way of life, especially salmon on the Stikine River and the Eunuch and all our Alaska rivers. Um, differences. Um, might have to think about that a little bit. Um, I saw a lot of similarities, but I'm tall pan and think it. <laughs> um, I'll let somebody else go next. Should I pick Kirby? Okay. You pick. Um, okay. I'd love to hear, or is Anita back? Okay, I'm picking on you, Tis. Would you like me to read the question again, Tis? No, I've I've got it. Um, I found out that we had more commonalities than um, I expected because I wasn't familiar with the the other side of the so-called border. I, uh, differences there wasn't that many. I don't think. I think we're all struggling with the same problems, but I think we have enough experience in to start solving the problems and like Tracy said we found out we we're related but then i think i've met relatives from uh telegraph as well so that was pretty exciting for me um there's a lot of them i know that <laughs> but um no that's about all i have it's been a a, a very very I don't know, surprising, I guess, experience, because I never thought I'd be traveling as much as I did this past year and listening to people's stories and heartfelt stories. So that's about all I have. One, one thing I learned and I really found, uh, not surprising, I guess, but I, I just didn't know this, but that, uh, the lower Stikeen is home to Ulicans. There's actually an Ulican run that, that comes up into the Stikeen. Um, okay, how about you, Alan? R read the question again, or you got it? Just, just give it, remind me of it again. Okay, um, what did you learn about the downriver people that surprised you working on this project? Um, I, I, I'm quite, um, consistent with the others, you know, there's not a lot of difference, but I do think that, um, our history of our two nations connecting has, um, uh, been one that's been there for a long time. And, um, you know, obvious, there's obvious differences. We're Athabasca and Tultan, and our language route is the Athabasca, theirs is coastal. So, you know, they get a little bit of language differences that way, but I do think that 
the stories are the same and the culture is quite quite similar and um you know what i what i found is that you know the the group on um, on on the coast of course has different kind of fishing techniques than us too you know they're on the ocean and uh we're up and we're up river and um so you know those are the kind of differences that i see but as a group we all have commonality we have the same interests we have a lot of similar cultural respect for the land respect for the water respect for our all our relatives thank you anita would you like to answer that question would you like me to repeat it you're on mute anita I'll, I'll repeat the question for you. Okay. What, what did you learn about the Downriver people that surprised you working on this project? Or were there any surprises? There actually, there was a lot of surprises for me because I learned that, um, like the history, there I, I really enjoyed listening to the the history of the people. I love learning about the different medicines. I learned um, I learned a lot about like different medicine use. I learned about finding relatives, and um, I learned about similar cultures but different. Um, but I also learned about similar passions and similar like we shared a lot of the same passion and love for the river and love for our salmon. And that was something that all of us loved. And we all had the same, and you know what else? We had similar history. We may came from different parts of the river and, but all of us had a similar kind of history um, with colonization, with our culture, with our history. And we and we all kind of shared the similar types of stories along the river, and so it was a surprise, but it was also um, sharing of commonality, you know, and a common experience that was really moving to me through this whole project. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Frank, is there anything that you learned? about um, the Taltan people or the upriver people that, that you found interesting or, or uh, uh, surprised you? You're on mute, Frank. Not really. The Taltan people never came down river that much. You know, it was, they came down working the sawmills here a little bit, but not, not too much. So, so when I was really very familiar with them, you know, other than Ed Kelbert would always bring down their salmon, you know, towards the end of the season for my dad, which was excellent, I must say. They they dried theirs more than smoked, you know, and it was really, it was great. But I, you know, I don't really know much about them or, or I just, just, uh, you know, just a few that I knew down here working in the salmon over the years, you know, but, uh, but they were good people, you know, but yeah. But I never really got into the culture one or anything like that, you know. I, just, I never really had a chance to study much about them, you know. So, so I can't really say I know a whole lot about them, other than I know they were good people. Lovey, is there anything uh, you you learned or was surprised about or were interested in about the people from out there? I love the stories that the tall pan people told. Um, I, I thought they were wonderful. I, I, I've always felt a connection to the Canadian side because my dad, well, the Haidas are from BC. So I've always been curious and um, I felt a connection to them and just hearing their stories was wonderful. My sister went to um, Old Masset and dug spruce root 
and she said it was everything she thought it would be. She loved it there. And I hope to one day go back. I think we've all got the same problems. Um, and I'm so glad we got to share them with each other. Thanks. Thank you, Lovey. I, I think that would be amazing to have a, a dinner or a, or a salmon summit or something like that and get the people <laughs> of the Stikine all together in one place. I think that's an amazing uh, opportunity. Um, so, um, so to, to the panel, um, what does the word stikine mean? And is that, is that the English pronunciation? Is there, is there a, 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 an indigenous word for the stikine? Stocking. Okay. And I've heard some um, people have called it the bitter water down this way. I don't know about the tall tan. Yeah. I was, I was um, talking to a tall tan who's a professor up in Fairbanks. And he was telling me that stikine is um, a very old word. And he was trying to find out if it had meaning. And so I want to give you a little story because it's the only way to answer it. Yes. If you go back and, and you, you uh, included the video about the Great Glacier and how it used to go across the Stikine River. And um, what this guy told me that, that Stikine means it's to swallow oneself and to give it back up again. Wow, amazing. Um, okay, I'm just looking at my phone. That's why I keep looking down. That's where I'm getting my questions sent to me. So <laughs> I'm not texting somebody else. Um, okay. Um, okay, to all storytellers, how do you stay positive and move forward under the looming shadow of the mining industry and, and environmental destruction? Anybody want to start that one? I'll start. Um, it's something working with this every day. It's uh, not an easy job. You wake up thinking about it and you go to sleep thinking about it. Um, but I think in the last few years um, that we've met up with the First Nations, it's given me some hope that I think with Indigenous people working together, I think we can come up with solutions. Thank you, Tis. Would anybody else like to comment or? I would, Kirby. I mean, um, I, I want to talk to uh, answer it this way. As indigenous people in, in British Columbia, we want to become self-determined people. We recognize that mining is important to our people, but we think it has to be done right. And, um, and to do it right, we believe that we need to start to exercise our right to self-government and to start taking an active role in decision making in the management um, of land and resource development decisions like this so that we can start to look out for our as we say all our relatives Thank you, Alan. Would anybody else like to comment on that? Okay, I've, I've got a question for Ryan. There's more questions here, but I want to ask one. <laughs> um, 
when we originally started talking about this project, it was supposed to be a live production. Um, and then uh, due to COVID, we had to, uh, we, we came across some challenges. Um, could you explain those challenges and how, how we moved forward? Sure, thanks Kirby. I, I mean, we were honestly coming across challenges before the pandemic began. And that is that I think that we, uh, I, it's been really exciting to be part of this team, um, that team of collaborators that bring a lot of optimism and sort of like, we're gonna make this happen sort of attitude. And I think I, I was right there. Um, but I would say from um, late summer of 2019 through the beginning of this year, 2020, uh, we were finding that um, funding sources were not coming to us as quickly as we'd hoped or not as much money as was coming to us, to put it bluntly. The original vision was indeed to do a live storytelling event and this piece is a part of that series of Ping Chong and Company theatrical storytelling events. Uh, the, the, the idea was ambitious to do uh, a, you know, a Stikine River transboundary theatrical production both in Taltan territory and in Wrangell and then tour it to um, communities including um, Juneau, Victoria, the state and provincial capitals and, and on and on. Um, to really bring the voices of community members who live in these places in these territories to um, policymakers and and um, people who are talking about the issues but not necessarily listening to people on the ground. Um, so we were in a little sort of like we're gonna we're gonna find a way to get there, but it was moving slower than we hoped um, to raise the kind of money we needed to do the live event. Then the pandemic began and shutdowns began. And uh, we had a group call that I've told many people about in the past few weeks um, that you were on, Kirby and Tiss and Anita. And it was, um, you know, I went into the call very gloomy, honestly. It was like, this is gonna be another thing that's gonna be a huge challenge for this project and we're just gonna have to put it on pause for who knows how long. And by the end of that hour, um, we were in a totally different place and I, I thank the other people on the phone call um, and Heather Hardcastle was on that call as well um, who said what can we do right now and then it took a few steps to mainly find out um, if the funders who were already supporting us would be okay with our using their support in this way um, us checking in with each other we had another call the next week we're like are we really sure we can do this and are we all ready to like lean in because it's gonna be need to move quickly and then we said yes. And so we quickly kind of whipped up this idea of how we can do this together, um, invited in collaborators to make this, uh, the, the digital production that you've seen, um, the, uh, the animators, the musicians, the editors, and, and then we went for it. So it's been, um, you know, a really um, moving process. And I think one thing that excites me greatly about it is that uh, Though I'm sad that at this time we're not gathered together in a room, um, we could never have done what we've, uh, what we've shared today in the way we originally imagined sharing it. Because I know that there's no way that the 10 voices who were in When the Salmon Spoke would have been able to and been available for a month of rehearsal, either in Telegraph Creek or Wrangell, and then a tour to the other side of the border, and that kind of uh, deep, deep, long-term involvement in something. So this format gave us a chance to um, share uh, voices that might not have been able to be a part of it otherwise. Um, and of course, today it's been exciting for people to be able to tune in from all over and to, to really reach further with it. So um, there were some, there were some things that I, you know, um, I'm sorry that didn't happen. And then there's many, many things that I'm, I've been really moved by in the past days and weeks. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we're, we're getting some mining questions, so, so let's dive right in. Uh, given the tailings dam disaster at Mount Polly Mine, the largest toxic mine tailings release in, Can in Canadian history, uh, that desecrated Quinal Lake and Fraser River watershed and the increasing number of mines in this region, what can we do to end the troubling trade-off between jobs and salmon? Anybody want to tackle that?
Well, Kirby, I'll I'll take a crack at it. I think um, I think that there's a few things I'd like to point out about mining and tailings and all this stuff. Um, mining, like all other resource sectors, are starting to get new technology and new ways of doing mining. And I think we have to explore that because you know, I hear, I hear these terms like dry stacking means you don't need to have telling systems. I'd like to see if that, why that is not a viable option for these mines in our territory. I'd, I also would like to have more science done on the potential cumulative impacts of mining on these water systems. So when you take a look at the area they call the Golden Triangle, you talk about mines like Lower, Lower Creek uh, Project, you talk about Copper Fox and uh, Shaft Creek Project. You hear about the uh, Kerr Salford Mitchell that Seabridge is doing. And I think we as Indigenous people have a sacred responsibility to try to protect the salmon. And so I think we need to talk about doing more of that kind of stuff to look at the potential cumulative impact. And then, and then to, um, and I, as I say, we need to start to make financial assurance a, a, a big part of the mine so we know that we can clean it up properly when they shut down. And, I, and so I'm, you know, there's lots of ways for us to engage with companies, lots of ways for us to engage with government and to start taking our rightful role in, in governance. Anyone else like to respond to that? Okay, uh, got a question and it's directed to TIS. It says, you mentioned that you have a shared sense of what the solutions are for the salmon with the upriver people. What do you see as these solutions for taking care of the salmon into the future? What I <clears throat> said was I have some hope. And we've had one summit way between first, we've had two so far, summits between First uh, Nations and tribal leaders. And um, we're still planning a third, but we have to sit down and figure it out. We, I think we had um, nine more leaders at the second summit than at the first. And I think they are all as concerned as we are. But um, right now the solutions aren't here, but I think it gives me hope that the, the people sitting at that table we'll be able to figure it out. And I totally agree with what Alan said about uh, new technologies. I, I absolutely agree. You know, um, if I could just chime in here, I, I think mining is essential. Uh, you know, I always tell people I'm, I'm not against resource extraction and I'm, I'm for protecting and defending the environment. Um, and, and I always say, you know, I come home and turn on my lights and flush the toilet and sleep under a roof. So um, all those all those uh, amenities require uh, mining. But uh, I totally agree with Alan. We we just have to figure out better ways to do it. I'm, I'm really excited about dry stacking. Um, I've also heard some rumblings about uh, um, some mining that's going on in Australia where they use air instead of water. Uh, so I'd really like to learn more about that. So they're they're cutting down on water use. Um, I'd I'd just like to ask another question. Um, what I'll start with. Uh, I'll start with um, Anita. Are you waving at me? You want to speak? Yeah. <laughs> you want to ask the question? Uh, no, I just wanted to chime in. Also, um, I I completely agree with what Alan was saying about the cumulative impacts. 
I think that with the level of mining activity that's being proposed in Teltan territory, and I've always felt this way, I know that mining is essential to our Teltan people, to British Columbia, to Canada, but I also know that salmon is essential mm -hmm. to us as Teltan people. And what I've learned throughout this project, salmon is essential to all of us who live on the river, who live on the Stikine River. And when we look, we need to look more at the cumulative impacts. What are the impacts? What are the long-term effects of having, you know, multiple mining projects and exploration projects in Taltan territory? When you look at all of these projects and you put them together, what is the impact to the river, to the people, to all of us, whether we're, you know, upriver, downriver, whether, you know, you're in Teltan territory, Gitsan territory, whether you're down in Clinkett territory, like what are the cumulative impacts to, to all of us or the potential cumulative impacts if we were to have all of these projects? You know, because, you know, our elders, I remember when I was, before I was even in leadership, I remember when our elders used to say, one mine at a time. And you would think, oh, what does that mean? Well, it means that you, you have one mining project right now. And we do, have a, we do have a mining project that is essential to our territory. We have a project that's happening right now, Red Chris. It means that you, you use that one project and you don't have other projects. You know? So that's what our elders were talking about. How do we do sustainable mining? How do you do that? And, you know, looking at, so you would look at all of the projects and add them up and put them together. That's what I mean. So that's what our elders were talking about. They were talking about not having all of these projects at once. That's what they meant by one mine at a time. And I remember they always said that. And I really hope that that's a practice that we'll follow one day. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Great, great, great answer. Um, okay, this, this one uh, is for all the uh, storytellers. Could you speak to the shared food culture, trade routes, barter foodstuffs in the past and the food webs today, and plans to share food and down the rivers in the future? Anybody come across some potential trading routes? You know, uh, Kirby, um, our people, as you know, on the West Coast had trading routes between them going back to the very beginning. And um, uh, we heard her on the on the uh, film and today about uh, about bringing dried salmon down and getting hooligan uh, grease from there those were those were the kind of things that did occur and um, you know our people at Taltan are very famously very well known for the obsidian you know and that obsidian was traded up and down the coast and um, you know, so I think it's, you know, it's, uh, I think that when you take a look at that trading history that goes back thousands of years, our people were actually trading those types of things that um, made a difference for how we lived on the land. And, uh, and I think in a lot of ways, shared culture as well. But if would anybody Frank, else like to Frank, you want to talk about the trading language? It was the mainstay of the native people. That's the way they lived. They traded all over. You know, they traded canoes for hooligan grease on the Stickeen River. Like I told Tess, everybody wanted to put the packages, the drawings on the rocks on the beach are at 
at the point down there where Chief Jake controlled the Sticking River. Hooligan grease was the biggest commodity that any Indians ever ate. They ate with everything. It was big. So they'd come clean across Prince of Wales Island. They had a swap cut across. They'd start on one end and come out by, by uh, Cough and Cove area, and they'd paddle up to the Sticking River to trade. And all them drawings on the beach were different clans that were allowed to come in and trade with the Indians. And they traded for canoes and stuff, just like the gentleman was saying before about, about the Flint Rock up on the Sticky River. It's one of the few places or no, in, the, in Southeast that does have it. There is a place down by the West Coast, a small place that there's some there, but very little. So it was a big, it was just a big trading. So without the trading, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have a lot of things that we have now, you know. They traded all over for everything. Everything was traded. I always wondered about the stone tools we had, you know, how they made them. Now I realize that they were probably weren't even made here. You know, it was during the trading that they, they picked all these different, different things up. So the trade route was, was really big, even from Telegraph all the way down to, to, to Wrangell Shores. You can see canoes sailing up the river years ago. They used to sail every afternoon, the wind blows up the river. And I always wondered, how could you take a canoe up the river, sticking river? In the afternoon, the wind blows up the river. The, but they had actually sail against the current. What about the Chinook language? The what? Chinook language. Oh, yeah. I was kind of laughing. She, my sister asked me about the Chinook language. I only heard it one time. And Tissa's dad spoke it. And I thought he was speaking Clinket. And I, I talked to him. I said, I never knew you could speak Clinket. And he said, I'm speaking Chinook. It was a trade language. And that's when I found out it was a trade language. And he was one of the few people I ever heard speak it. It's very much like the Clinkett language, not as thick, you know, but but that was a that was a trade trade language they used. It's enough language that everybody can speak. Everybody that was in the trade. But that's about all I can tell you about about the trading and stuff. Thank you, Frank. Um, I've got a question here for all the storytellers. Uh, what history was missing? And when the salmon spoke, um, so so what needs to be told that wasn't that that you would hope to have made it onto the onto the production, but maybe didn't. Trixie looks I, like she wants to say something. Oh no, Lovey, go ahead, Lovey. Sorry, I don't think we left much out. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I can't think of a thing that we left out of the. Um, yeah. I I listened to a lot of the uh, interviews, and um, there were some amazing stories that were told that uh, I think would be really interesting to share. Uh, Anita, did you want to say something? Yeah. The, I, I really loved the whole production and being a part of it. I just think it was really, really powerful. I loved how we connected the history from Alaska right up to Caltan territory and how all those pieces were put together. And that was something that was really powerful for me to learn. And, you know, I said that during the production that, you know, sometimes we have this colonized way of thinking where we only think about ourselves and our territory, and kind of the impacts that are happening to us right at the moment, you know. But when I went and met other tribes and when I had that opportunity in leadership and had the opportunity to meet other tri tribes from Alaska, I really got to hear how mining would impact them and how you know we ha we shared so much commonalities about you know we shared the love for salmon our culture the river you know and and it really moved me that you know here's all of these people and all of these tribes that were kind of being left out of the process because it's an international border but yet we share the same river 
and that's something that's, you know, really, I really want us to hopefully build on those relationships and those ties in the future. I hope that we get to, you know, come together as people and come together and talk about those impacts to the river, you know, or the potential impacts from the mining that's happening in British Columbia, because, you know what, it may be an international border, but it does not separate the blood ties, the history and our relationship and our connections to the same river. And that is one thing that I learned. And it's, it's not that it was left out of the project. It was just something that, I gained from participating in this project and you know and meeting the and meeting the tribes from Alaska so many years ago and I hope that we all get to come together as a people in the future once we're out of COVID <laughs> and you know I also want to say that this project really helped me in COVID because we got to share our feelings and, and to connect to each other as human beings and, and talk about things that we love and that we're passionate about, which is salmon and the river and our culture and our history. And, you know, whether it was Ryan being in Brooklyn, New York, or, you know, Lovey and Frank being in Alaska or Kirby being in Gitsan or Alan being in the South and I was up in Terrace at the time, you know, we all got to share that connection. And, you know, during this COVID period, that was a really important thing. And, and it actually really helped me um, lift my spirits in a time when my spirit was really, really down. So I just wanted to say, not that it was left out. I just wanted to say Madhu, which means thank you and tell time. And Nettie's chart means much love. Thank you, Anita. Alan, would you like to say something? Um, yes, um, I, I was thinking about the question. Um, it's not so much what was left out of it. It's, it's, um, but some of the history that I think needs more to be expanded on would be things like, you know, recognition of the hereditary chi systems. So the fact that Chief Shakes is the hereditary chief down there, and the fact that in Taltan we had chief, uh, our hereditary chief was Nanak, you know, I think we could pay tribute to those guys, to those hereditary leaders of ours. And, um, you know, the, the story really of, uh, of how we are basically become one people is through that, you know their their leadership and getting our people married into each other so you as you say we're one family um i think it's also really important to under to understand when we talk about taltan territory that it's we got ninety five thousand square miles of traditional territory and we have um the skeena the nas the stikin the eunuch and the uh, Taku, they all start in our territory, one one from the from our land, and um, you know it just gives you an idea how big a territory it is, and it's rich in resources. Thank you, Alan. I think Ryan, did you have something to say? Thank you, um, and thank you, Alan and Anita. I I, I just want to acknowledge the. The limitations of the container, if you will, you know, making something that we want to reach people and we want to invite people to to spend their time um, listening to and being with. Um, there is some mysterious amount of time that is a good amount of time to do that, and then then longer becomes less likely that people will hang. Um, so that's a consideration, and another consideration is. Um, another way that we often use in this process to help determine what is shared historically is what links to the life, the lives and the life stories of the people who are participating so that the, the links are always connected personally here. There's a personal kind of heart connection from the people in the piece um, to the histories. And those are the histories that we're gonna try to tell and it helps us make those choices. 
but I'm acknowledging it as a limitation because it is. There's so much missing. And I just want to, uh, as one example, um, lift up something that um, a commenter on Facebook posted during the watch party about an hour ago. And I'm sorry that I'm forgetting that person's name, but they posted, um, whoa, you know, it moves chronologically and we blew through the 70s, 1970s. And then this person posted, say, hey, wait a second, you know, BC Hydro attempted to build a dam on the Stikine River, 1978. And that was a huge transboundary issue. And that effort failed after a lot of fighting. And I don't know that history. And I'd honestly, um, I'll confess, forgot about that plot in the process of making this piece. Um, partly because it didn't come up in detail in any of these interviews, but that could well be a flaw in the interview process, not in the fact of that not being a connection for any of the people in the, in the group. So that's one reminder to me today of how much more there is to these stories. And I haven't even started talking about the, the many powerful life stories and lived experiences that we heard in the interviews that aren't in the piece. So there's lots that's missing in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, Trixie, any comments? Yeah, well, not too much more to add as far as missing goes. Um, um, I'm still uh, thinking of everything that I learned and um, um, maybe going back to the trade stuff again. I can. <laughs> Um, um, cause that's where a lot of our, uh, I know that our ancestors, um, the, the sticking clinkets were, and were known, um, as, you know, fierce warriors and, um, tradesmen and it's because of the river and all the rich resources that came off of the river. Um, and it was fun to learn about, you know, um, things that we can share and trade now, um, it's like Alan said, he, he was surprised to hear there's Zuligans, and that's one of our prized things. And sounds like they have good dry fish. And and when uh, Rhoda from Iskit, the one that's not on today um, because she's in mourning, um, she talked about a place they say, I couldn't catch the name on the video, but she said it was a sacred place about medicine where her people went to get medicine. And um, I can't wait to talk to her about that of course, um, and see it. I can imagine it's amazing. Like I said, that Sticking River is full of medicine. Um, and like everybody said, it's resource rich. Um, um, maybe one thing that would have been nice to pull in, maybe a youth or something. Um, but I think it was good overall. Um, this is just the first um, discussion panel. So I can't wait. I'm looking forward to, to more. Thank you, Trixie. Yeah, I I witnessed all all the relationship building and uh, finding your family, so to speak, and it, it was pretty amazing to watch. Um, Tis, do you have anything? To, do you think there was anything that was missed or anything you'd like to see? Um. I don't know. Well, we've already talked to a funder about doing other rivers. So that's, I mean, it was just exciting to hear all these stories. And so somebody threw out, well, let's do something similar on the Skeena or the, you know, some of the other rivers. So I don't know. I'm trying to retire. So <laughs> uh, and these guys can be persistent. So we'll see. Anyway, but I, I just love the idea of sharing of uh, stories and there's so much more to tell. There's so much more to find out and to learn. I'm like Trixie, you know, I want to go up there. And one of the other storytellers, Anita's dad, invited us up and we'd have a place to stay. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Tis. Uh, Frank, do you, have, do you think there was anything? I'm not sure if I asked you this question already. I've I've gone around so many times. You're muted. You're on mute, Lovey. There we go. No, I, I was listening to you talking a while ago about mining in Australia, how they use the air 
I can tell you the reason for that is there's no water there. Yeah. That's what he used there. And you'll never see that in Canada, you know, because they got all the water. They have the Stinking River running down there, you know, plus all the other two rivers that run into it. So you'll never see them mining like that, I don't think, you know, unless my personal opinion. But the only reason they do it in Australia is because there is no water, you know, and they have to use air. But uh, it's a complete different style of mining altogether. But I keep asking myself as I sit here and listen to all this, you know, you're having all these meetings with Canada and that. And I watch a lot of uh, stories on the Canadians and how they dam the rivers up and uh, how the Native people had no, no words or talk. But, you know, and I just wonder how this is all developing. It's just another formality that we're going through where we sit and talk with them and try to settle something, you know. And they just, uh, you know, we're just a small, we're just a small bunch of Native people compared to them. You know, or they just, they just talk, pacify us, and they do what they want. Well, I, I think um, we can be pretty powerful when we, when we stand together and, uh, I, I was kind of hoping that this project would um, um, rebuild those relationships and uh, hopefully we can uh, maintain them by um, sticking together and, and communicating with one another and uh, talking about the, the issues that, that we have, you know, uh, around uh, resource extraction and, and uh, the health of the rivers and, and the health of the salmon. Would anybody else like to chime in or do you guys have questions for each other? Does anybody have a question? I, I have. Sure, Lovie. Um, um, I I've been thinking about this. This, if you think about it, this is the first time this has ever happened. Um, the Zoom and all of us getting together and telling our stories. I, I feel like it's, I'm part of history, but I think it's just going to get better and better and better because I think this is the way of the world now. Um, we're to meet like this, um, at least while the COVID-19 is um, upon us. But I went to the first meeting and the second one, um, or the summit, the difference between the first one and the second one was that the communication was much better um, it, and the trust was greater in the second meeting. And I came away feeling like we could do something if we stuck together, if we had open communication and um, we trusted each other to do what we said we were going to do. And I feel like we've come a long way. I, I think as if we stick together like brothers and sisters, we're going to do great things together. But if we separate and do our own thing, we're going to have a harder time. So together we can accomplish much. And I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that because I think this is awesome. Thank you, Lovey. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments for other panelists? I, I might venture something if I may, Kirby. Sure. Uh, just kind of in response to the conversation, uh, these these past few comments. Um, uh, you know, I, my my role has been, in in some ways, you could define it as a technical role, just um, helping to <clears throat> to create a process and an outline for how we're going to do this and and create something that can to that can share these conversations and um, that kind of and, and then keep us on a calendar and things like that. Um, I, you know, I have I just can't overstate what um, a privilege and an honor it has been to be invited into this work with the people who are on this call and the organizations who are collaborating, who have dedica dedicated their lives um, to this work. And um, I've had a steep learning curve around um, the issues at hand. Um, but I will say that one of the things I've learned is that there's been a lot of challenges and they are illuminated in the piece 
um, created by the border is just one example of the many challenges in the past century to communication across the border. And what I've heard from folks in our different collaborating organizations in the past two years is that the, pro the fact that the project was, has been focused on um, sharing stories has uh, maybe opened uh, some possibility of communication um, that was sometimes harder to do when the attempts were about um, talking about policy or sharing concerns and issues. Um, that's important too, but to start from a place of like just trying to connect and understand who we are um, between whoever um, can, can sort of ground everybody on, on a playing field together. Um, so to come back to like, where does this go? And to your question, Frank, um, I think that's a long um, journey of continuing to build and cultivate that kind of connection. But I hope that, um, that, that this project and process is, is cultivating um, uh, some, some kind of you know, initial return to what was there before colonization wrecked it all and created these, these um, barriers. Um, so I, I think it's been really exciting and again, a huge privilege to just bear witness to these relationships regrowing again. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else, questions, comments? Just wanted to give the panel a, a, the opportunity. Alan, would you like to say something? Sure. Um, I wanna take a moment and speak for Mother Earth. And I wanna speak about the fact that water is life, that it's really up to us to, to take some kind of a role to protect our water and to make sure that we do everything we can to keep it clean. I think that in the COVID-19 era, when we talk about the impact to us as individuals, to our families and to our fellow member citizens, <coughs> Things like food security is becoming a big issue. When you watch people um, go crazy over, over buying food and whatnot and making it difficult for some people to actually get enough food to live, sort of points out that some of the work we're doing here is about food security. You know, we're talking about protecting the salmon that's our food source. And it's really important to talk about protecting the environment or the habitat of it, the salmon, you know, and, and this idea of um, like we're, we're, like I say, we're at the Baskin, so salmon is really important to us, but so is the moose, you know, so we, we hunt moose uh, for, for our food and uh, so it's important for us to protect that habitat. So when we watch what's happening in climate change, we need to we need to do everything we can to to try to slow that down and we all should recognize that our our mother earth's in trouble and we need to start to unite as indigenous people and try to figure out how to how to protect her madhu thank you very much alan uh, wise words would anybody else like to uh comment on, on uh, food and water security? I, I will. Y you know, we need to go back to the old ways. Our father and our forefathers before them never took more than they needed out of the water, off the land. Um, they, if they fished one area one year, they left it alone so the stock could build up and it went to another area. I don't ever remember dad overkilling anything. Um, so we took what we needed to eat and we left the rest alone. We need to go back to that. We need to go back to the old ways because the old ways to me were better than what we're doing now. So I'm with Alan, we need to protect our waters, our land, everything. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. 
I want to I want to comment on my sister just said. One time this land was our land. We owned it all, you know. We controlled it all until the Russians and Europeans came in and took it from us. We controlled everything. We controlled the fish, the deer, everything. The cedar bark that came off the trees, everything. But that's all gone. We don't have that control anymore. You know, you have people fishing. You have, you have the fish game managing things, you know, or trying to manage it. And uh, in my opinion, they do a poor job, but uh, that's my opinion of it. You know, but I mean, it, it, things will never be the same as far as I'm concerned, you know, because we have no control, you know. We, we can talk about it, but uh, our voices are too small, I believe. Thank you, Frank. Oh. Go ahead, Trixie. Well, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, I think we do need to look at the old ways and um, especially around collaboration um, with others like we're doing now. This is great. Um, that, and I do see hope in um, where I see tribes, they're already working on monitoring the fishing and um, the water, water. And I think we need to be ready as tribes and um, um, governments to be ready to manage our own fishing game sometime. And I see that happening. Um, I see that happening sometime. We should be able to manage our own fishing game. We should be able to manage what industry comes into our area. I think we're getting closer to that with tools like UNDRIP, um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and I learned a lot about that from the Canadians, from the tall hands in meeting and through the Transboundary Commission. And um, so I think there's a, a lot of opportunity to build on the old ways for sure. Um, but we need that new data and, and um, of monitoring you know, the water and making sure the water stays clean when mining goes in and, and really being, and being at the table when those decisions are made. Um, I say it all the time, I'm gonna keep saying it. <laughs> Um, um, indigenous people have a lot, um, a lot to give, um, and we need to be ready when the opportunity comes and we can um, be at that table and making those decisions locally. I guess that's it for now. Thanks, Trixie. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, thanks. I, I just want to take a moment to, to um, share something that I've learned from many of the people on this call in the past um, two years, which is that, you know, I'm somebody who aspires to sort of think green and be more green. And that um, this, uh, there's a sort of really important link in that chain of what makes a green economy that, that I hadn't really considered, honestly, which is if we're making green new energy with technology that relies on rare earth minerals that are coming from mines that threaten salmon fisheries, then it's not green. If the, if the clean economy, the clean green economy destroys salmon fisheries or threatens them and threatens the people and communities on those rivers, then there's still a huge problem and it ain't clean. And that is something that I think I just want to offer is like, what do we do? And I think we're in this moment in society in the world where the systems are changing and shifting and a lot of us are in a place of, I don't know what is happening and where do we go from here? And I think, I hope there's opportunity in that. And I just want to point to three things. One is IRMA, the um, Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. Check it out. It's um, it, working for industry-wide standards for responsible mining. Um, the second is Salmon Gold, which Alan mentions in the piece, and that's his work. Um, to again lead to responsible mining where the sources are known by big industry including Tiffany and Apple. Um, and then three is Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission. Um, if you have the means, donate to SEIDC and support their work so that indigenous people lead the charge and how this looks and works in the future. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so we've been on the call for our Zoom for an hour and a half already, folks. This, this time has just flown by. Uh, great conversation. Um, um, I, I don't know if people want to stay on a little bit longer, um, but um, I, I would like to, 
I would like to wrap up with, with one question. Um, what, what is your fondest memory of salmon and how is it important to you culturally? Uh, let's start with uh, Fred, you're back. Cool. Thanks. Fred. I guess the thing that I always, always remember is, you know, being out there getting salmon. Sometimes not fun working commercially with my dad, but sometimes fun dip, net, dip netting in the Carta River. You know, and so you had the same feeling you're doing something your dad did, your dad's dad did, you know, on and on and on back in history. And just maybe I don't have to come back on and on. Just really like to thank everybody for participating in this project. And hopefully it's done what we really hoped it would do. You know, why SEITC, Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission, supports the project, wanted to work on the project, is to put a face on the river and, you know, words matter and where things come from matter. And you could even hear it in the discussion. You know, without being preachy, you can hear what kind of our, what our point is. Like you hear talk of resources, you hear Trixie talk about resources, you hear medicine, you hear Alan mention moose, you know, you hear salmon. Of course, industry resources are gold, silver. For us, water is life. For them, water is a tailing storage medium. <laughs> you know, it depends how you look at things. And so hopefully you just want people to pay more attention. And we're going to keep building the unity across the border and the many borders, the different U.S.-Canadian border, but the different borders between us, the tribes and First Nations. So like us on Facebook, visit our website scitc.org but yeah great job Kirby to facilitating thanks to everybody thank you Fred um, Kirby, yes love you can can I go next because I have to leave absolutely uh, my favorite memory of fish is eating boiled fish heads with my dad <laughs> and I came home from work one day and um, he had our daughter, who was about one, oh, about three, on his knee, <laughs> and she was eating the nose, eyeball. oh, the eyeball out of the fish head. I just had a bit. He said, "You used to do it." So, yeah, that's the greatest memory I have of fish. She grew up to be a smart teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lovey. Mm -hmm. Frank, your earliest and fondest memory of fish? <laughs> you know, I'm, trying, I'm sitting here trying to think. I, I have so many memories, you know, fishing with my dad. I guess fishing with my dad was probably the greatest thing in my life at that time, you know. Like I said, it was, it was hard work. It was, and, you know, we traveled all over, you know, spent a lot of time on the West Coast. And, and uh, it was just good times, you know. But as far as fish goes, I can honestly say uh, the Stickeen River dried salmon was probably the finest fish I ever ate, you know, to this day. But uh, yeah, I've eaten a lot of fish, trust me. But uh, but it was one, you know, I, I have a lot of fond memories of fishing. You know, like I was talking the other day about, you know, about things that uh, a lot of people have never seen, like the like the side rigs, you know, they, they went out way back when they were little, they're about 40 foot skiffs that were towed around with trolling boats and real shallow sands that you go way up on the beach and make a set, you know. And uh, the last one I saw, well, I was about 15 years old. I believe it was a fish hound, Kratovich out of Flock at it. But it was the last one around. And it, it's a lot of, it's, it's something of the past. People don't even know what they look like anymore, you know. But, uh, 
I have a lot of fond memories of fishing, you know, and uh, and uh, a lot of good time, a lot of good stories. Thank you, Frank. Tis, earliest and fondest memory of uh, salmon? It's not the earliest one, but I love coho, trolling for cohos. <laughs> you see those fish come over there. The side rail, and I'd be counting in my head how much money there was. It was, and it was smooth water, so I like that. So, <laughs> all right, thank you, Tiss. Anita, how about you? Your earliest and fondest remember memory of salmon? Probably like Tiss. It's not my earliest memory, but <laughs> yay! <laughs> yeah. I wanted to show that. Um, actually, yeah, I can bring two memories together. I remember when we were kids and we'd take jarfish, like salmon sandwiches to school and we thought we were poor, right? Like we just thought, oh, salmon again, like fish sandwiches again. And, and you know, like, my best memory is uh, of my late mom teaching me how to make canned salmon. We went down to our fish camp in, in Glenora. It's a culture camp that our people have. And we all, like if you, you don't have a camp or if you never learn how to do fish, then they teach you that. They teach you how to dry fish, can fish. And, and, it, and so this is like over... 10 years ago now because my daughter was probably only three years old and um my mom was there and uh we were learning how to can salmon that day and she helped me to to learn how to do that at that camp and you know now that she's gone like that's a very very precious memory that i hold dear to my heart and, and now i go back every year or i try to go back every year to canned salmon and and I you know get together with some of my good friends and or else at our camp down at Six Mile with our McPhee family and we all like prepare salmon together and it's it's just such a beautiful thing to share with your people and and I love doing that and and now <laughs> I know that I'm not poor like you know how much work goes into making this fish and like Fred's showing right now, like it's it's a lot of work to to make canned salmon, and there's a lot of preparation to you know whether you you gotta catch it, clean the fish, hang the fish, and then you gotta cut it up, and and you have to can it. Like it's a lot of work to get the fish in this little jar. So if you can do that, you're a very very rich person, and you're blessed to have that. So with this um, production that's something that I learned is that how much we all love our salmon and how much we love the stikin so thank you Madhu. thank you Anita um, Trixie did I I've gone around so many times I hope I'm not asking you the same <laughs> question <laughs> well Ever since I can remember, my dad in the spring, um, my all my parents and um, everybody was happy when the salmon came back. Everybody, um, but and that continued um, from the time I was little. I remember we'd be looking for fish, and I remember when we were little, I was young. There was lots of salmon returning all the time. You could see jumps everywhere in front of Wrangell, and all the creeks were full. You know, Pat's Creek. Dad liked to go out there and because you could see good, you know, he could stop on that bridge even as he got older. So it's always been a big deal for us when the salmon come back every spring. It's like um, you're happy to see them and you thank them because, like, they're your relatives, right? Because they are. <laughs> um, so spring is special to me because um, that's when the fish are coming back and all summer. But. And that really reminds me of my parents and how grateful they were for salmon, for their livelihood and to feed their family. And um, I guess that's it. Thanks, thanks, Trixie. And uh, that reminds me of uh, 
a phrase that Richard Wright had said, uh, you know, the Gixan person who passed away last week, he said, uh, salmon bring families together and salmon keep families together. And it's absolutely true. Uh, uh, Alan, would you like to comment? Uh, well, you, you uh, your comments about Richard, exactly my thought. You know, I come from a family of 20 children. And when we were young, our mom and our dad used to make sure they came together on a regular basis. And so I grew up with my older brothers and sisters coming home for special occasion. So my memories go back to those days when we used to go back from Hatland back to by, with my mom and my dad. And we used to visit our grandmother, you know, my dad's, my dad's mom. And I, I share that, that uh, one of the best things to do is to have boiled salmon. You know, and, um, and in the last, uh, you know, 30 years, 40 years, our family started going back and as a group. And it's not uncommon now to go back to our fish camp and see 60 to 120 people. So it, it does bring our family together and it's, it's what holds our family together. We have much to be thankful for. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I'd, in, in closing, I just want to give the panelists and the storytellers, uh, um, it, is there any closing comments that you'd like to share with, with the, the rest of the storytellers, uh, the audience? I'll start because I'm going to take off in a minute. Okay. Um, I would like to say that it was an honor to be a part of this project. Um, I think it's really important to communicate, to build these types of relationships. I think it's, uh, you know, it's kudos to Ryan for putting this together in such a short timeline into the uh, Salmon Beyond Borders and the uh, Transboundary Commission for the vision to see it and to put it to, and take the leadership in making it happen. And, uh, and I always enjoy being in conversations with you, Kirby. I'm, and uh, all the best to you guys. Madhu. Thank you, Alan. Anita, would you like to say something? <laughs> sure. I was waving to Alan to talk oh. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, Madhu. Um, you know, this project just really, really moved me and it made me, um, I, could, I just really enjoyed learning the history from all the indigenous people who are part of this project. And, you know, I just wanna thank Ryan for working so hard and bringing it all together. I mean, it's just amazing what came out of this project. You know, I watched this last night when it came out. So I was so excited to, to watch it. I watched it at like five in the morning. <laughs> and I was just moved by all the stories and how well it came together and just really amazed by technology about like, you wouldn't know this was by Zoom. <laughs> watching this and that's it's just in a really amazing way of telling our stories and i just thought it was really really powerful and i was really proud of my dad like this, you know like he he did such a great job i was just really really proud to see him and i was proud of everybody but it just you know to to hear my dad tell those stories. And now when I phone him, I ask him to tell me a story now because he has so much to share. And, you know, we, we take that for granted. And I'm not going to say as a younger person because I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> but we, we take it for granted, you know, that there's people who are older than us and they have so much to offer and share. And 
And I really, really appreciated all the stories from this project and it really moved me. And I just want to say Madhu means thank you and Teltan and Nettie's Cha means much love. Thank you, Anita. And yeah, your dad really moved me when we were interviewing him. I was, uh, yeah, it, it was really moving to hear your dad's stories. Um, Lovey, would you like to say any final words, comments? Um, I'd like to thank Ryan, Tiss, Heather, Bree, everybody that worked so hard on this. It, it, it's a wonderful way for all of us to share and to come together. And I just wanted to say how Ganeshjish. Frank, would you, do you have any final words? No, I just like to say, I think you guys did a wonderful job. It, it was great to hear all the different stories and things. And I especially love that Canadian accent. <laughs> <laughs> What accent? We don't have an accent. You do. <laughs> you don't have an accent, eh, Nina? <laughs> hey. Hey? No. Okay. Um, Tiss, would you like have any final thoughts? No, I echo all of your sentiments. Everything, especially Anita's dad, that was, I think, the most moving story I've ever heard yeah. throughout this whole process. But thanks to all the backup crew. Ryan, you did a wonderful job. Heather, Bree, Jill, who am I forgetting? The narrators. And you, Kirby. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Fred, have you got any final thoughts or comments? I don't think we lost my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kirby. You did a great job. And all of you, Anita, Tiss, Lovey, Frank, Alan. It's just, it was really great hearing the stories. And Ryan, thanks for your patience. And of course, Tiss. It's just been a joy to work with Tiss. She's the best employee and the best boss I ever had. <laughs> it's uh, funny. And all the best to Tiss in the future, but I'll be hounding her bothering her but yeah thanks again and you know it really is it is all about this it's it's about our way of life you know we're not asking for racial preference it's we our group talks about the and stresses the government to government relationship that federally recognized tribes have with the united states federal government and but we're not talking about, you know, just fish. We're talking about a way of life and where the fish are and how you get them and the history behind everything. And like we touched on in the project, the stories, we call it stories, but it's history, family history from real people for generations. And so it's really been a great to be a part of this. And uh, I want to hear from more of you. For, I don't want to talk too much. And Tis, come on, you need to say something else. <laughs> but yeah, how are you? Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Fred. Um, Trix, did I ask you this already, Trixie? Gosh. Final comments? Um, I guess final comments. Um been amazing. I, every time we get together and talk, I learn something new about not just all of you and but about myself. And um, um, Guna Chish to each of you and all the people in the, that did all the background work, Jill and um, Brianna and Heather, of course. Um, I know I'm forgetting somebody, but it's been an amazing experience. I look forward to, you know, building on this and our new connections, right? And um working more with uh southeast indigenous transboundary commission and salmon beyond borders all of you you're all amazing you inspire me thank you thank you ryan 
Uh, I just want to say thank you as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words and then I'll, I'll um, it's, it's been an amazing journey. You know, I remember the first time I, I met you all and, um, you know, sometimes you meet people and, and they go and they never come back. And, and sometimes you create these relationships with people who, who become family. And, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I really appreciate you guys. You guys have become family. Um, it was an honor to be part of this project. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we're hoping to do uh, projects on the NAS and the Skeena as well. Um, similar types of things where people can, can tell their stories. Uh, so uh, look forward to that. Uh, viewers, uh, a couple other things. If, if you're viewing this on, um, if you're viewing the video on Zoom, and you've registered uh, for the event, you can find in, in a couple of days, you'll get a link uh, to be able to watch the video again, uh, anytime you want. It'll be stored in a place where you can just click on the link and watch it. Uh, also, this conversation will be stored and able to watch at a later date as well. Nice. Um, I, really, I really encourage everybody to, uh, to get to know and understand uh, the issues and the challenges that salmon are facing. Uh, really, we are facing the same challenges because whatever happens to that water that we all depend on, it, it impacts us all. So uh, I ask you to inform yourselves about what projects are happening in your river, uh, in your watersheds, what's happening in the ocean, Find out what's going on, inform yourselves. You have the right to free prior and informed consent. You have the right to say no. You also have the right to say yes. You have the right to say maybe with conditions. Um, so support your local uh, water, land, uh, salmon, food security, defenders and protectors uh, like Skeena Wild, who I work for. We are at skeenawild.org if you'd like to learn more. Um, so yeah, I just encourage you to learn more and, and find out what you can do to help, uh, uh, you know, protect salmon and protect the water. Um, and with that, uh, I think we are done. <laughs>